you. I'm uh, used to uh, reading poetry aloud, and um, I'm not very used to reading prose, so I'll try and modulate my voice. Like uh, our guest before me, Joseph, I am too a daughter of emigrants. I was, um, my parents emigrated to London in the early 50s and uh, I was born there in 1956 and uh, we came home when I was a baby. But uh, Joseph got a Birmingham accent where I got a Dublin one. So I am, um, I will read the first chapter of my memoirs, um, The House of the Stained Glass Butterfly. I was eight when I started my writing career as a writer, writing poison pen letters. <laughs> True, these required little or no imagination, being dictated to be by my grandmother. They always began with the same lines, you, your hardened stag, may you never have an hour's luck, taking the bit out of the mouths of five orphans. And always the same ending. Don't forget to put your name at the end of it. Strangely enough, I never addressed any envelopes. But if I ever did arrive, I'm sure the recipients would never have been more than a little bemused, since I'm sure that they never heard of me. Anyway, I hope nobody ever received them. As far as I can make out, the letters were to do with the grave of my grandfather, but she never spoke about her husband. My grandmother was a most fascinating woman. She had the most amazing teeth. One day she would have a silver tooth, the next day a gold one, but wore these only when going out. In the house she wore none at all, which made her face look all soft and squiggly. Another thing about her is that she had a short leg, so she wore one high heel and a flat shoe, her footsteps making an uneven tap on the lino. My father and herself never saw eye to eye. The first time they ever met, he had taken my mother to the Star Cinema in Crumlin, which had just opened. It is one of the few times that he was sober. Kitty, my grandmother, was down on her hands and knees, coursing one of the neighbours. The man had performed some small job around the house, and she had insisted that he had a ham and tomato sandwich before he left. My fa father took a violent dislike to her after that, and they never spoke a civil word to each other for the rest of their lives. Also, she instilled a fear in him that he could not shake. One night, shortly after, when he was again had refused the offer of tea and a ham sandwich, my mother had remarked that one of the neighbours had died. I know, said Kitty, I heard the other one walking on the lamppost all night. What other one, my father asked. My mother had heard it all before. She's talking about the old one who cries, the banshee. My father took a fit of laughing. Kitty, full of indignation, stamped her foot and pointed a warning finger at him. The next time you see me, the laugh will be on the other side of your face. There was a thick fog that night. My father, on his way back to Inchip Court, stopped under a street lamp on Rafters Lane to light a cigarette. Then he said he saw the most hideous being. It was about three feet tall. The face was like something out of the bells of hell and it had long grey hair sweeping to the ground. I think he was about 22 years old and a very good runner. He raced all the way, home shaking, and for the rest of his life, no matter how much he needed to drink, he would never be tempted to venture out in a fog. Kitty also held a terrible grudge against Dublin Corporation, her family home, a cottage, 
when in wind may lane dark of their road. But it is in its more terrace, a row of single stories cottages. Her mother's name was Mary, whose ancestors had lived in the village. I think she died in the great flu outbreak in 1918. Anyway, when Kitty was a young woman, she was living with my grandmother's father, my uncle Desi, and my mother Mona. The corporation decided that the slums in Dublin city had to be cleared and put a compulsory purchase order on the land that once belonged to the board Flanagan and built the houses there. My great grandfather Jack worked for the board as a ploughman and I suspect that they got their cottage. I remember getting my photograph taken with Jack in the long grass in the half acre garden behind the house. Kitty did not lick it off the stones. He was another one with a warm heart. It was told that his mother walked all the way from Wexford with a bantam cock under her arm and we, he would not let her in. My parents met on a blind date and ended up in court. A friend of my father, Phil, <coughs> had a girl lined up for a double date and Mona was persuaded to go along. Phil was a well-known ladies' man, according to himself. <laughs> In later years, he would often tell me stories, <coughs> slightly racy ones. At the time, I could not make head nor tail of them. They all had a feed of drink in a public house. Phil, Kathleen and my father. Mona, as always, was stone cold sober. When closing time was called, she went in, they went to the bona fide in Rathfarnham. As far as I could tell, it was a place where you could be served drink after hours because it was outside the city boundaries and the licensing laws did not apply there. About two in the morning, one of them must have decided it was time to go home, so they packed into Phil's car, but he lost control and they ended up in a ditch. Somehow the guards were called and they were all summoned. Mona was the chief witness and she was the only one who could remember. So after a couple of sessions in the courthouse, Phil was fined, given a warning and Mona and Jimmy were going out. My grandfather on my mother's side was pure Norman. Her ancestors had come with the invasion in 1169, so blood won out. She had the most beautiful blonde hair, although in later years it came from a bottle. Eyes of the most vivid blue, and in contrast, dark, sallow skin that took to the sun very easily. I had never met my grandfather. He died in the pigeon house in Dublin from tuberculosis when Mona was 18. On our lunch break from work, she would try to cycle across the city to see him. This had to be done with utmost secrecy. TB was a shameful disease to have in the family, so no one could be told where she was going to. Mona adored her father, she spoke of him often with tears as a kind and gentle man who had a fine singing voice. All of his family were singers and musicians. As a young man, his spare time, he helped to build a grotto in the grounds of the Oblitz Church in Jacor and was buried in the blue habit of a child of Mary. Whenever I am on the Lewis, and the tram stops in Drimna. In my mind's eye, I can see him running across the Lansdowne Valley to Cork Kitty. At that time, there were no houses. The ones that are there now are part of the slum clearance scheme, just like Drimna. At the other side of the valley is Drimna. I think that this is the oldest moated castle left in Ireland. It was built in 1216 by the Barnwalls 
a Norman family. There was a famous love story about the daughter of Sir Hugh who built the castle. Eleonora fell in love with the chieftain of the O'Borns who had lived in Wicklow, a sept of the clan who lived in the Dublin mountains, who used to raid the houses in the valley below. The girl was to be married to her cousin in Christ Church Cathedral, and on her wedding day, the old born came riding down to take her away. In the battle that ensued, the chieftain was killed by the barn walls, and it was said that her wedding dress dripped blood all the way to the ceremony. Like my father, I had the great knack of giving directions, naming hopes. So if you ever on the number 50, 56, or 77 buses, you will know where the Eleonora Bar and Lounge got its name. Thank you. <laughs>